Thank you, Brian. Or should I, or should I call you Groove Master? Yeah, new nickname for Brian. I don't know if you knew. Uh, I'm doing well this Sunday. Thank you for asking. Uh, we are in the middle of a relatively new series. We're in week three of a series called For All. It's based in Acts 2 that this promise is for all generations. And isn't that a great representation of the church we're in right now? This is an all generations church, which is an incredible gift. And it comes with some complications, shall we say. Uh, like any family, being of multi-generations, there's conflict, there's friction, there's questions that naturally arise as one generation comes up after another. And so we got to talk about it. I think it's actually a very healthy thing that we reflect on ourselves every once in a while. We say, how are we doing as a family? So today we're talking about harmonizing the stages. Ooh, ah. I think my third or fourth time preaching, and now you guys are caught up to the ooing and the eyeing, and it's, it's pretty gratifying, I'm not going to lie. Harmonizing the stages. So you probably fit somewhere on this timeline. Maybe you're a child. Any children with us today? Besides Kevin Santa Cruz? Oh, Steve, yes, very nice. We have children, we have teens who are fantastic and did a great job last week leading us in worship and in, in knowledge and stature. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with our youth ministry. Uh, we got our college students. They're fine. Uh, Allie and I leave the campus, and we're getting to know them a little bit better, uh, and we love that stage more and more every time we spend time with them. Uh, you might be a single, a young professional person, right? Don't you love a roll call? It feels like a retreat right now. Uh, you might be a married person. Yeah! You might be a parent person. Yeah! You might be a seasoned person. Don't we love having a box to fit in? Don't we love being in a category? Well, this is actually not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have stages in life. This might be some version of your American dream that I'm going to get educated, and then I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get a husband or a wife and some kids, and that, that might be your sense of what the good life is. And this thinking, of course, comes into the church. We sort of categorize ourselves. And there's some very valuable reasons to do that. Uh, who likes hanging out with people in their stage of life? It's okay to say, yes, yeah, I like hanging out uh, with people our age. We're getting to know some of the couples here, like the Fitzmyers or the Sterosics or the Adams, and awesome couples that are in our young married stage of life. It's really helpful to have friends, to have peers to talk through things with. Um, if we did just marriage lessons for the teens, it would probably get confusing after a while. We need teaching, we need mentoring relevant to our stage of life. But this is not everybody's version of the good life. It's great to have categories, it's great to have stages, and it, it's very cool when the stages naturally line up one after another. But not everybody's life looks like this. Where, where's the single mom who goes back to school at age 45? That's a, that's a weird line if this is the way that it always works. You know, some people don't fit into any of these boxes. Some people are trying to figure out which box they fit in. And some people don't want the marriage thing, don't want the college thing, don't even want the parent thing. That's perfectly fine. But if every stage is just naturally leading into the next one onward and onward, things start to get a little rigid. What I want to talk about today is the, the tension we feel with the stages. And then how do, we, how do we live in the stage of life that God's put us in? And how do we work together in our various stages of life? Maybe you feel bound to this. Like, well, I, I got out of school. I'm a young professional person. I'm not really feeling the marriage thing. What do I do next? Ah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Maybe you feel like we need to blow it up. The anarchist in you is like, no stages. Intermingle everything. That might not be the answer. The question we're going to ask, how do we remain unified while honoring each individual stage? This is not about erasure. The word I want to use is harmony. No lines, no upward trajectory that instantly leads to a certain predetermined outcome. No, this is all of the stages working together in different sounds, making one unified sound. The clarinets and the, the violins and the trumpets and everybody doing different things, but somehow it sounds good. Um, I've worked on this for about two weeks. I've been working on this sermon, and I don't have a solution. 
Sorry. Have a great Sunday. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. Um, I'm not going to share a solution. I don't know if there really is a solution to uh, the, the natural conflict that comes up with diversity. Diversity is a good thing, but like, I don't know if we can solve that in 30 minutes. What I can offer you, though, is a vision. It's not my vision. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud that it's not my vision. It's a big one. It's kind of scary for me. Uh, a vision, actually, from a guy named Paul, who was a church planter and a writer and a teacher and a thinker. And he uses a vision, actually a metaphor, of a household. This is something he uses over and over again in scripture. He talks about the family of God as a household. The word that gets used, the Greek word if you're interested, is oikos, which I'm pretty sure is a yogurt brand now. <laughs> right? Yes. We got to reuse, recycle. That's what I'm saying. And the idea of an oikos is not the idea of the house that you live in necessarily. It's more about the relationships that you live in. And usually that's going to mean a settled place, but it's not just like the nuclear family, if that's what you're used to or, or grew up with. Uh, it's really more about the people that are in orbit around your life. See, back in the first century, most households were also hosts to businesses. So you'd work at home. Must be nice, right? Harkens back to COVID times in a certain way. Uh, it's a place where you settle. It's a place where you find belonging. And so this could include family members. This could include non-family members. And this stands, the, the way that Paul describes it, he describes the household of God in stark contrast to the Roman household of the day. A Roman household was about hierarchy. There was a powerful man at the top. Amen, right? Uh, and that, that man, that, that head of the household, was meant to direct the household and kind of be over it in a certain way. If you were a spouse, a woman, if you were a child, it was better that you would be seen but not heard. Right? This was a time of slavery, unfortunately. And, and slavery factors into the household thing. And so slavery, you know, the slaves in the house would be the lowest rung of the house. And so what do you do with this household metaphor? No, no, you, you turn it on its head. And, and that's what Paul does throughout scripture. He flips over the idea of the household. And it's no longer about hierarchy. It's about harmony. Yeah. It's about children who obey their parents and respect them, but parents who respect their kids as well. It's wives and husbands who are not in competition with one another, but they actually lift one another up at their own expense, the same way that Christ lives up the church. Yeah. It's about masters who don't oppress their slaves, but honor them and love them and make them part of the family. That is the metaphor of the household. And he uses it over and over again. 1 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 4, boom, boom, all the way down the line. Paul and other writers talk about God's household. Not just your household, the way that you're supposed to live, but the way that we are meant to live together. One of my absolute favorite ones is in Ephesians 2. You can turn over there real quick. We need a new vision. We need a new vision of what family looks like in this day and age because our world is desperate for family. We talked about this a little bit at our Campus Devo on Friday. Loneliness is at an epidemic level in the West. It is scary. Uh, I shared a stat with them that I, I found alarming. Uh, I think back in 1960-something, they did a, a survey of friendship. And the average person uh, considered themselves to have 3.7 close friends on average. Today, that number is 1.2. So you have one third of the friends you used to have. Scary. Loneliness is at an all-time high. One of my favorite writers, David Brooks, he talks about how commitment is where the best lives come from. Our best life, life to the full, is based in commitment to a cause, commitment to a community, commitment in marriage. And I believe that this is exactly what Paul is hitting on here in Ephesians 2, verse 17. He talks about commitment. He said, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. 
He uses the metaphor of a household, of a temple. That is who we are. And this, this passage, I love that he talks about consistently being built up. That the household of God is not a finished product. If you're here for the first time, this is so far from a finished product. We have a long way to go and a long way upward and bigger to get. We have to be built up inwardly and outwardly. In the household of God, foreigners don't exist. There's no more foreigner status. There's no more outsider status. There's no more strangers. Now you are family. In the household of God, we have a real lasting foundation of healthy teaching and, and the example of Jesus Christ, and we get to host the Holy Spirit. We talked a lot about hospitality here as a church, and we will continue to. We host God's Spirit week in and week out, not just on Sundays, but as we live together in our various stages. This passage also points to some key pitfalls for unhealthy churches. I hope you picked up on this. Uh, how about this? A disconnection to the Holy Spirit. It says, for through him, we have both access. We, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Churches that are afraid of the spirit, churches that don't understand the spirit, don't have access to the Father, and they build, they deform into unhealthy households. Another one. How about households where people still cling on to their old status? Well, I used to be this, and I couldn't shake that identity as I entered my new family. In my old family, I was always a failure. In my old family, I was always, you put your story in here. I was always an outsider. I was always a stranger. No, no, there's no strangers in the household of God. And if the household of God is treating newcomers like strangers, there is something deeply off. Non-households are non-familial, and they have a weak foundation. And I don't say these things in any sort of judgment. Actually, I think we do a terrific job as a church of acting like a family. I, I could cite a million different <laughs> examples. One of my favorite ones is Jamie Quist doing TikToks with the teens. There's something that, that only really happens in families, right? Like just the ways that we love and accept and honor one another all throughout this church. But we got to stay intentional because these pitfalls, the opposite of this vision is just around the corner. It really is. You, you see unhealthy church, unhealthy family, one after another that, that fall into these traps, a disconnection to the spirit not being familial, not loving one another, not relying on sound teaching. That, that can be the anti-vision. Let me share another vision with you here. In Titus chapter 2. Titus two. Come on, Josh. It was too many words, so I didn't make a slide of it. Sue me. Titus 2, verse 1. Because you brought your Bible, so you're fine. I, I, I must say, I am like shocked and honored by the number of people who bring paper Bibles every Sunday. It's unbelievable. Right? In this, like, in this digital world, we got analog people still rocking it. So cool. And if you're scrolling through your Bible, we love you too. No shame. There's no judgment. Jesus has reconciled everything, so you belong too. <laughs> Titus 2, verse 1. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Amen? Amen? That was a very self-controlled response. Thank you, guys. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them and not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We'll stop there. This may um, prick some of our 21st century, uh, more like liberal, progressive uh, ideals about where we stand in the world. We live in an individualist culture. And so the idea that, that I'm going to be defined by my relationships to other people can sound very offensive. 
You might say, well, I'm more than just a, a wife and a mom. Yes, you are, absolutely. Uh, even, gosh, in verse 9, we, we don't operate under this slave master uh, paradigm anymore, thank God. But there's something in here that I think is incredible. What he says over and over again as, as he identifies the stages, older men, younger men, older women, younger women, what he says is that you are defined by your relationships to other people. He says, older men, be worthy of the respect of others. Live your life in such a way that others will respect you. Older women, live a respectable life so that you can train the younger women. Younger women, be the kind of mom, be the kind of wife, be the kind of you that anybody can respect. Young men, live a life of self-control so that you will be respect. Like over and over again, it's about living the kind of life that honors and respects one another. He honors and he names each stage, but he places them within relationship. This is a little bit different than the teen, campus, single, married thing that we tend to do. Both are different. Neither one is necessarily better than the other. But I wonder what would happen if we stopped defining ourselves by our education, by our marital status, uh, by, by whether or not we have kids, by any of those things. What if we stopped defining ourselves that way and started defining ourselves and identifying by our role in the household? To say, I am an uncle, blood or otherwise. I'm a mom to some people. I'm, I'm, I'm a son or a daughter or a nephew to someone. It's something that I love uh, in island cultures, whether it's Hawaii, Samoa, the Philippines, anywhere, anywhere you want to go uh, with Pacific Islands, you hear a lot more uncle and auntie. Something that I love in that culture is that you can be an uncle or an auntie even if you have no blood family. There's something deeply, deeply kingdom about that way of thinking. That's how households are made, by ignoring stage and, and, and instead focused on family status. Think about for myself, um, I, I'm a husband already, and I'm a, I'm, a da I'm a dad, which is weird to say. I still have, I mean, he's only eight months old. I'm still like, whoa, I'm a dad. That's crazy. Um, that, those are gifts that God has given me, but even being here for a few months, I get to be a brother yeah. to folks. I get to be an uncle to a campus ministry. Maybe like a cool cousin. I don't know. I kind of got like a cool, <laughs> like, uh, no? All right. That's fine. Uh, I get to be a nephew. I get to be a son, I get to be a grandson to people in this church. And, and, and that speaks to where our church is at, that, that people want to wrap their arms around my family and love us and treat us like family. But it also speaks to the gifts that God's giving us by being in community. You get to be so much to so many when you live in the household. What role do you play in our household? Are you a wise, seasoned elder that, that doles out wisdom left and right to anybody who will hear it. Are you an uncle? Are you an auntie? Are you, are you playing the role of mom or dad for somebody who needs that in their life? Hopefully, hopefully you're a brother or a sister to very many people. But you might also be a niece or a nephew or a, or a son or a daughter to somebody who needs it. We are, we are defined by our commitments. Our life is made good. It's made whole and full by the ways that we give ourselves over to others and commit to them. And that is the vision of the household. Now, is there practical value in the distinctions of campus and single? Yes, absolutely. But there's a huge leap from church organization to kingdom representation, right? That, hey, we need to organize ourselves. That's awesome. But much more important than organization is the fact that we're shining a light to our community. Look back, look back at verse 11 really quick. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That is the defining trait of the household. That is what motivates us and defines the way that we live. We live under grace and salvation has appeared to all men. We want to represent that to the community. Salvation is for all and we need to represent what that salvation looks like in the here and now and not just later. We talked about this a little bit with the campus and we're going to keep talking about it. So if this sounds weird to you guys, it's all good. Uh, we are representing heaven right here, right now on earth. Amen. This is heaven on earth in your household, around a table, on a Sunday or a midweek or in a small group. That is what this is. And for most people, the way that they're going to experience heaven on earth is going to be in a household. Why? Because so many households 
are so jacked up. You don't need me to tell you this, right? The idea of family might be challenging for you because we, we hear it everywhere, right? Your workplace, we're a big family. Or maybe you grew up in a situation where family was not uh, the warm and fuzzy thing that you see in a Disney movie. Maybe you have challenges with the idea of family, but in God's household, we redefine family under his grace, yep. under his salvation. That is the household. Amen. The beauty of God's household, it's not in its structure or its organization, or it's certainly not hierarchy. It's in kingdom-bringing relationships. Yeah. Can I give you just one example of that? Uh, Allie and I moved here, and we didn't have a place to live. <laughs> Goofy, right? But before we had ever moved here, before we even signed the papers to, to be on staff here in the church, we got a text from the Kingans. The Kingans said, would you like to live with us forever, basically? <laughs> Not forever, but you offered like three months, which is a lot, actually. Three months, and we have a baby. That's a big commitment, but we did it. We lived with them for a month, and it looked a little something like this. It's pretty cool. I know what you're thinking. You think Cody, Cody looks so natural and like just loose in this picture. He's like, you do. There's a bear right now. This is what the household looks like. It's seasoned, mature, still very fun and encouraging and awesome grandparents who are unrelated to the couple in the middle that just moved across the country and up, up, upheaved their lives and their infant. And then Cody, who's fresh out of college uh, and, and living his best life in that way. That is a strange picture. It's a diverse set of experiences. It's a group of stages that don't perfectly interlock together. We have different schedules and different lives, but that's what the household looks like more often than not. One of my favorite things when we were living with the Kingans was, was meals around a table on their fantastic, humongous deck with the pergola and stuff. <laughs> Invite yourself over, please. Sorry. <laughs> but just like this, this is right after a meal that we had together. We're talking about life and music and road trips and Alaska and all, all the stuff that we were experiencing. And in that moment, we weren't a single and a married couple and a child and, and a season. No, we were just Family. And that is what I think the household can look like over and over again in this church. Some pathways. And like, Allie looks great in it too, and I'm just like, man, we are, we are winning here. Uh, some pathways. Some things to consider about how we act out our lives as a household. First and foremost, it's a shared standard. Uh, in Titus 3, we're not going to read it together, uh, Paul goes from explaining uh, you know, instructions and advice for different stages, and then he converts it to instructions and advice for everybody. Houses have rules. Uh, one of the rules in my household when I was a kid was that we don't you know, wear shoes around the house. We take them off, right? Things like that. We have a shared set of standards as a family. It's right here, right? So do you have a shared set of standards? Do we share responsibility as a family? You know, we need ushers. We need people to run tech. We need people uh, to get up and worship. We need people to take care of our kids. Do you share responsibility? I want to challenge you. If you're a member of our church and you came here without a job today, go find one. Come on. Go share responsibility with somebody who's been doing it for a while. Yeah. Maybe you're like, I love that brother. He's always uh, at the front door greeting everybody. Stand next to him. Share that responsibility of greeting and welcoming. You know, maybe you've been here for a while and you don't know where you fit in in the family. Find something to do. You will find your role very, very quickly. Uh, maybe my favorite one, shared tables, just like we talked about at the Kingan's house. Sharing a meal together is the easiest and probably the most fun way to build family. I can tell you from personal experience, being the recipient of a loving meal train, I've got some folks in this church who can cook. You will be taken care of, so share a meal host a meal, invite yourself over for a meal. This fits into the idea of adoption, not just, not just older folks adopting younger folks. No, 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 no. It's younger folks adopting older folks. It's renters adopting house owners. It's uh, you know, single people with a little bit more time adopting families with young kids. That is what adoption can look like. It's not just top down, it's down up. No matter where you stand in the stages, that is what harmony looks like. 
Uh, no clumps, by the way. No clumps. You guys know what I'm talking about? No clumps? No clumps, guys. No clumps. What are we talking about here? Uh, Allie and I used to work uh, with a, a youth camp in the Northwest where we're from. And I had a rule, which was uh, if I see a large group of campers with no counselors, alarm bells. But if I see a large group of counselors with no campers, alarm bells. <laughs> Something has gone terribly wrong, because somewhere there's an even larger group of campers without their counselors, right? <laughs> uh, I don't like clumps. I don't like clicks. Uh, and I don't think that, that, that clicks and clumps really represent the family of God. Uh, if, you, if you catch yourself consistently with your peer group, nonstop, and never anyone else, Alarm bells, right? It's fun to spend time with people in our stage of life. I never want to knock that. But if it's consistently, man, we're all in the same stage. We haven't had anyone outside our stage hang out with us in a long time. Alarm bells, no clumps. No clumps? No clumps. 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 And the last one, extremely valuable, Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who is that command to? Everybody. All submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's one of the shared standards that we must have as a community. How can I serve people in other stages? These are some questions to ask as we close out. How can I honor their stage with my stage? Maybe I'm in a stage where I have a lot of free time. How can I honor somebody who has less? Uh, Maybe I have a lot of resources in my life, materially, however you want to put that. How can I honor somebody who has less? Maybe I'm somebody who lives a very simple life. How can I honor somebody who's extremely busy, right? How do we honor people with the stage that we live in? This takes a certain level of awareness of where others are at. Another question, what do the other stages have to teach, have to teach me? I wrote it, I can't even say it. What do the other stages have to teach me? How can I be a student to people in other stages? We just shared the experience of being the student of the teen ministry for one Sunday. It's a vibrant experience. It's pretty fun. I learned some stuff, and I really, really enjoyed it. But honestly, I don't, I don't naturally make that my posture anymore. When I see the teens, sometimes, I know this is going to sound crazy, I'm like, oh, guys, calm down. I want to be the teacher a little bit of, hey, can we, can we pull it together? Rather than, okay, what can they teach me? What is TikTok? Explain it to me, right? <laughs> How can I be a student to the other Stages. And then, so important, what do we have in common and how can we intentionally share it? We share so much, not even just our relationship with Jesus, not even just a mission. We share, we share so much. We have so much in common that we don't even know about because we're not asking. Guys, these pathways, shared tables, shared responsibilities, shared respect and submission for one another, this is how we build upwards to become the household that hosts God's spirit, that oikos, I love that word, a place to belong, a place to settle, a place to build relationships and commitments. Guys, I hope and I pray that our church will continue to mature into a thriving and growing household. Let us be an interdependent network of relationships that's built on the foundation of Christ. Let us be a kingdom bringing beacon of healthy, productive family, inviting other people into our home Let us be an alternative society infused with God's spirit, living in perfect harmony. Grace and peace to you.